Good evening. Good evening, everyone, and welcome. My name is Cameron Bailey. I'm the artistic director and co-head here at TIFF. I want to thank you all for coming tonight. It's my great pleasure to welcome you to tonight's exclusive event for members, Dexter Fletcher on Rocket Man. Yes. And if you are here and you're also a Raptors fan, thank you for your sacrifice. Uh, you will be able to pick it up in the second quarter probably after uh, this event is done. Um, to begin, we'd like to acknowledge that tonight's event is taking place on the treaty territory of the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation and the traditional territory of the Haudenosaunee, the Anishinaabe, and the Huron-Wendat. It's important for us to offer these land acknowledgements um, as a kind of small but uh, we think essential step towards reconciliation and as a way to activate and remember the history of the land uh, that we're on now and that has been taken care of by the First Nations who've been on this land for many, many generations. On behalf of TIFF, I'd also like to thank all of the people and the organizations who make everything that we do possible, beginning with our lead sponsor, Bell, our major sponsors, RBC, L'Oreal Paris, and Visa, and our major public supporters, the Government of Canada, the Government of Ontario, and the City of Toronto. Thank you to our donors and our members. I think this is a room full of members and donors. So thanks to all of you for supporting uh, TIFF all year round and our charitable mission to transform the way people see the world through film. Uh, and in case you haven't heard, uh, there is more you can do to further support TIFF by getting tickets to our upcoming fundraiser, which is the TIFF Trivia Showdown, which takes place on July 4th up on our rooftop. And unlike uh, this, this week, we think it'll be fully warm and summer by July 4th, or we're in trouble. Um, tickets are on sale for that now at tiff.net slash trivia, so you can get your uh, trivia team together and flex your knowledge of film. Big thank you to Paramount Pictures for providing us with this film, which is in theaters now. Um, and uh, we have a little bit of disappointing news. Um, Dex mm, Dexter Fletcher was at the airport. His flight was delayed, so he's not going to be able to make it. But he has uh, agreed to do a Skype Q&A with us right after the screening. He'll be not here in person, but up on the big screen, Skyping in from New York City. We're, you know, I don't, I don't want to mention an airline or an airport or anything, but um, they were late. Uh, but we do have a little uh, special treat for you. We were able to get one of the other people involved with the making of the film to record a special video message just for you, and we'll play that just before the film. Enjoy it. All right, we are now going to try to go to New York City, and we hope we have via Skype the director of Rocket Man, Dexter Fletcher. Hello, Dexter. Hey, Cameron, how are you doing? Good, good, how are you? I'm, I'm so sorry that I'm not there. We've had this terrible weather problem and I... Oh, it's I'm all right. Blocked. I'm really sorry. We're going to blame the Newark airport. Okay, blame somebody. <laughs> Just don't blame me. Okay. <laughs> Uh, listen, thanks so much for making the time. Um, we have just uh, finished watching Rocket Man. It is a fantastic film. Enjoyed it so much, didn't we? Thank you. Thank you. One of the first albums I ever had was the first Greatest Hits album. I played it till the it was just you know unplayable anymore. I love those songs, and you've used them so well in the film. Thank you. um, you've got a long history in music. What people may not know is that your very first screen appearance was in Alan Parker's Bugsy Malone as a child actor. Yeah. Right? <laughs> yes. Through nine years old, I was. Yeah. Um, you also much more recently directed Sunshine on Leith, uh, which is a great, great musical film as well. Thank you. And what you've done here is not a chronological biopic, but more a musical uh, that leaps into fantasy sometimes. And that's how uh, we end up hearing this, uh, uh, seeing the story uh, through um, Elton's songs. Um, can you tell us how you decided on that approach rather than a more straightforward approach? Um, well, obviously, I wanted to create something as different and as original as possible. And 
Um, I think the the uh, you can hear me okay, can you? We can. Yes. yes thank you. Yes. Yes. Um, so so um, you know, and and it was being sort of touted as a biopic, and and I never really felt. Or approached it in that way. I felt that it was it was a, a musical that was really a, a man sort of unpacking his recollections of of his life and and trying to you know put his house in order and and that gave me the freedom to jump around and kind of explore a timeline that was really about a memory and about his recollections rather than a, a chronological retelling of what he wrote and when he wrote it. So that very much like a musical the songs become a, a a way of of telling his story where you know so where the characters can kind of stop and open their hearts and sing directly to the audience really and um and once i once we really keyed into that it, it meant that i i wasn't sort of hemmed in by this traditional biopic as it were and i i, I tried to imagine it much more as someone telling the story of their life and that's you have to use different different tools to do that you know you have to use your imagination and your feelings and, and try to communicate them in, in different ways you might say oh, I had a great night at the troubadour but it's better to say I had a night at the troubadour and it felt like everybody flew for a moment mm -hmm. you know so and, th and that really gives it that magical kind of uh, imaginative leap that that just hopefully takes the film away from being that more sort of traditional uh, biopic. You know, I thought all of the those musical numbers were really brilliant, but there were two that really stood out for me uh, particularly. One was the Saturday Night's All Right for Fighting number where you see him come of age and grow up, uh, become a man, become a rebel, and through the course of, of just the musical um, performance and the, the dancing in that number. And the other was then Don't Let the Sun Go Down on Me, which is so poignant mm -hmm. later in the film when mm -hmm. you, you get to see him meet and marry his wife and understand what that means and and what a kind of a, a sort of charade it is in a way, although he has deep feelings for her. Um, and there's so much narrative compression. So many of the events of his life are compressed into the course of the three or four minutes of a song. Um, can you talk a little mm -hmm. bit about how you, how you mount technically something like that from the script writing stage when you're figuring out which parts of the story you're gonna fit into that song to, to what the choreography looks like to suit the storytelling, that, those kinds of elements. Well, I suppose when, when you get to those big numbers, you know, uh, um, these big set pieces, because that's what they are, they're, they're, the songs can do different kinds of heavy lifting story-wise and dramatically, and, and even in terms of moving, you know, huge swathes of time through, you know, like Saturday Night's All Right for a Fight, it's really a, it, it sort of takes place over four or five years because he goes in as a 13-year-old boy and emerges as a 19-year-old, you know, uh, young man sort of thing, 18-year-old guy. Um, so, so it's just about making sure that those set pieces uh, deliver more than just, okay, now we have a song and a dance. That For me, they very much had to or gave the opportunity to to move through huge chunks of time that otherwise might have been fairly boring. You know, him sort of growing up into a young guy and trying to, you know, devise scenes of him seeing other influences of cultural, you know, uh, cultures coming in from around the world. And we can compress it all into that song and and into that dance. But then there's other numbers that are, are much more contained, like uh, Don't Let the Sun Go Down On Me. And... And what you discover as you as you mine these lyrics and these songs is that they're they're you know they're, they're poems really Bernie Bernie Taupin's lyrics and 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 all their stories and and it's about finding a way of letting those particular stories uh, do some work in terms of what what needs to be achieved with the film like moving things along and and that's it's actually a real joy uh, to discover that you have a song like Saturday Night's All Right for a Fight and you can move through sort of you know, five years of someone's history in a matter of three minutes. It, it's, that's, a, that's a real gift. Uh, brilliantly um, done. You took some liberties with the songs. These are not the recorded versions that some of us know from the, the AM radio in the, in the 70s and 80s. Um, no. 
And uh, I like that. There's even a kind of a ska and a country bit in Saturday Night's All, All Right for Fighting. Um, yeah, yeah. And that must have been a real decision, especially as you're working with Elton John and the David Furnish. These and and all of the people involved in the film are still very, uh, you know, they're very present in the making of it. How did you go about deciding that you wouldn't do just the versions we all know from the pop charts and reinvent the songs in a way? Well, that that really came from one of the first meetings that I had with Elton. I, I, I after a meeting David and talking about kind of dramatically what what I was going to be sort of looking for or or how to you know move the film along uh, that way, uh, I got a call to go and meet uh, Elton and have lunch with Elton which was, of course, an extremely exciting moment. Um, and, I, and I went with Giles Martin, uh, the, the music producer, who's known Elton for many years. He's, his dad, uh, George, had worked with him. And, and Giles, George Martin, the Beatles producer. Yeah. Um, and Giles had, had, had known him since he was about 13 and told some extraordinary stories about finding backgammon sets full of drugs that had been left at his house <laughs> and stuff like that when he was a kid. Um, uh, but don't repeat that. Too late now. Um, <laughs> um, but but so Giles and I went for this incredible. You know, we went for this lunch in Vegas. I got flown out to Vegas, and I suddenly realised that I was in a very different world. I'd never been further than you know the cent central London for a lunch meeting before. But now I've been flying to Vegas, uh, and, and we sat for sort of three or four hours talking about music and life and his life and and the film. And and he said very very clearly very early on to both me and Josh, he said you can't just do cover versions. You've got to use the music, use the songs to to you've got to create them in your own way. You've got to reimagine them, do something different. Because if people want to hear my versions, they can go download those or buy them, or they exist. They're already there. There's there's no real point in Tara just re-sing as closely to what I did because where's the Where's the fun in that? You know, where's, well, how's it any different? We're not just trying to do a, you know, a, a, like a jukebox, so, you know, and he was adamant that Taron should sing, as was I, because it's a musical. If you go and see any musical, you expect the actors to sing their roles. That's, that's, that's standard, really. Um, so once I understood from him that that's what he kind of expected, really, that, that again gave me another freedom that was really exciting and another... Uh, um, you know, another exciting way to explore these songs, and 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 his expectation was very much that, and I di I really didn't want to disappoint him. And also, I had Giles Martin, who's an incredible producer, and Taron who can sing amazingly. Um, we're we're going to go to our audience for questions in a moment. There's just one more thing I want to ask you before we do that. Um, yeah. Elton's uh, life partner is David Furnish, who you will know is from Toronto, grew up in Scarborough, actually, yeah, in the suburbs yeah. of Toronto. Yeah, Shout yeah. out to Scarborough. And um, he was also very actively involved as a producer on this film. Um, and I wonder, how did the two of you work together on shaping this story? How did you work with David? Well, David, David started the development of the script about 10, 12 years ago, from what I understand. I haven't been involved in it for the project for that long. Um, but he was the first person I met. I mean, I, Matthew Vaughan, who's the other producer, is an old friend of mine who, who worked on, uh, on uh, Eddie the Eagle uh, with, with me and Taron. Um, but I, I went and had this, uh, another long lunch with David and, and spoke about, you know, what my ideas were for that and what I really felt the script and the story was about and how I'd like to develop things as, as the director. And, and that, that obviously went well because here I am now. But David um, was really... You know, he's the, I suppose, the custodian to a certain degree. Look, it's his, it's his husband, you know, and, and but also there, he knows Elton better than anybody and is extremely clear about what Elton wants and uh, how he felt about things. And it was very clear that, that Elton wanted it to be as honest and as uh, a raw portrayal as possible so that, uh, 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 that that's kind of reflective of who, uh, who Elton is. And so David was there on a day-to-day -day basis. You know, he, he was there. I mean, he wasn't there every single day. I can't claim that. But he was there more often than not. Um, and and he's, like, he's like an Elton expert. I mean, he's like, if you haven't got Elton, you've got the next best thing. Uh, and, and so that's an invaluable resource to have just in terms of just, of, you know, creating the mood or in, term, in terms of how Taron might approach something. I mean... It's not, 
to say that he was he was jumping in going, oh, no, 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 he wouldn't do that. But if there was something you'd want to, you know, sort of discuss and talk about, he, he was there as, as that that touchstone, really. Um, so like any good producer, he he was there when he when he needed to be and 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 quietly in the background when he when he needed us to let us get on with it. Um, and of course, it's it's. It's down to him that the film's got made, really. He brought the script to Matthew Vaughan eventually, and Matthew Vaughan is who brought it to me and got Taron involved. Um, so, I mean, I, I don't think his, his, his contribution can be underestimated, really. He, he's, he's justifiably proud of it, and I, and I think he's, he's fiercely proud that, that it's his life partner, as you say, and they have a beautiful family together, and that they have this film that Elton's insanely proud of and, and and always says this is the film I wanted it to be which can't be any greater compliment for us really as 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 the filmmakers and I think I mean I really worry you know if I was making a, a film of my my wife's life and I got it wrong and she was, and she was <laughs> that'd be a problem yeah that'd be a big problem that's a, it's, it's a brave man who does that yeah. Yeah. True. True. all right we're gonna go now to our audience there are microphones on either side of the room if you got a question please raise your hand can we go to this side first just pass the microphone in thank you that's great <laughs> Uh, thanks so much for making. Away with seeing myself on the screen. Really. <laughs> uh, thanks so much for the film and for sharing your, your time with us. Uh, just a You're question welcome. for for uh, for a, a person who's so much larger than life, who's such like a living legend, who I'm sure there's millions and millions and millions and millions of stories. How did you go about untangling the person from the legend and telling a story that was true and yet representative? Um. Yeah, sure. There is lots of stories, but I, I suppose my job and, and what I was always searching for was an emotional truth as we went through this story. And this is what we I spoke to Taryn a lot about. And, you know, all the all the stories and all the incidents and scenes that we happen uh, that we see happen are based on some form of truth or story that Elton spoke to Lee Hall or, or myself or David about. Um, and but really the the real trick or, or the real intent of the film is to is to keep the emotional life and the emotional connections uh honest and 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 real and 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 then that way hopefully um it's representative of, of elton as he as he as he was at that period and what he was going through um so i mean we Taron knows elton very well knows him probably better than i do and a lot of it is, I suppose, my interpretation of those events. But Elton read the script after I'd worked on it, as did David, and they were like, yes, this is the film we want to make. It was then down to me to, to make sure that I I keep that, that emotional line through. That was not the most important thing to me. Um, uh, that, that that stays consistent, that stays honest, that makes sense. And... And I and I feel that we've achieved that in, a, in on the whole, uh, and I think that's what gives the film its its authenticity. That Elton watches the film and he cries. I think there's things in it that genuinely move him because he feels connected to those moments emotionally, uh, um, as as he as he did at the time. That's that's uh, uh, so. It's just kind of yeah, being 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 faithful and honest to to what you believe is the truth. Thank you. All right, let's go over to this side now. Anybody on this side with a question? Okay, let's go over here. This gentleman waving two arms in the air. <laughs> I actually don't have a question. I have one word, and that one word is Terran. <laughs> Fantastic. What? What? Like, you just inhabited Elton. No. I, 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 yeah, I can't disagree with you. I mean, from the moment that he came on set in, in his in his first costume, which was the Troubadour, actually, he was in the Troubadour was where he first started. Um, but it's you know what it's about. It's about a pursuit of truth in acting, and that's you know what he's after. And he has this incredible ability to be vulnerable and fierce all at the same time. Most people can only do either one or the other. <laughs> But but few of us can do it at the same time, and I think for what we're looking at, you know, because we're, we're, we're exploring someone uh, sort of 
fighting their vulnerability with their anger, you know, trying not to be vulnerable. That that it's it's that incredible uh, commitment level of Taron's to 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 the, his pursuit of the truth and and the character that he's 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 portraying that that just eradicates any doubt that he is Elton. And in that, you know, from the moment, that's why I let that first shot of him when he sits down and says, how long is this going to take? And then he just lists all those issues that he's dealing with and he's fighting and, and anger management. It's just all one take. I just slowly push in, slowly push in, so that hopefully by the end of that speech, we're like, this is the guy. Because that speech is so incredible. Uh, um, I do it a few times because he's he's simply phenomenal. He is. All yeah. right, let's go over here. Hi, thank you so much for taking the time to do this. I had an amazing time watching this film. Um, one thing, uh, like talking about the vulnerability, this aspect and theme of love, of like loving oneself, love from others, I found very endearing. And uh, one aspect, and now I'm kind of losing my train of thought. Um, I, ha I had the question, I had a thought out. Um, we'll wait. <laughs> Okay, I'll think of the backup one that I had. In terms of the look, in terms of, you know, just making sure that... Oh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> um, in terms of the look uh, and the aesthetic and the costumes and everything, I'm, I'm wondering the relationship between, like, Elton and David and your art, uh, art and costume mm. designers of just, like, what access did you have to make sure that you were able to hit, like, all, like, the right beats for that? We, we had complete access to Elton's archive and David uh, Furnish gave us, there, there's, I think there's like two warehouses uh, of costumes and memorabilia and flyers and tickets and programs from, from over 50 years worth. Of, I mean, this is just the stuff that he's kept. God knows how much he's lost over the years. Uh, but the costume designer, Julian Day, had access to all of that. And it's amazing actually because there are scenes in dressing rooms where Elton's actual costumes are hanging on the rail. Uh, we, we didn't we didn't wear any of them or use any of them uh, on Taron because they wouldn't have fit, to be quite honest. Elton was tiny when he was in his 20s. You know, he was a, a skinny young kid, um, even though he felt like he was fat, but he wasn't. Um, but, but because the film is a memory, I, I was really keen to push push the levels bigger and, and brighter and bolder than they maybe even were at the time. And um, because the memory allows us to play tricks or to, to exaggerate. And, and I really wanted, um, you know, the costumes to, to really make this impact like that devil costume, that angel devil costume he wears in the beginning into rehab that nothing like that really exists. That came from the mind of Julian day and myself. Um, you know, after talking about these heart-shaped glasses, he's looking for love. You know, that's that was really, you know, those kind of discussions that that you have in in, in development of of, of uh, certain looks. Um, but yeah, they gave us access to everything, and and um, and and Julian's great challenge was to create a costume that Elton said, oh, I wish I wore that, or I wish I'd had that, <laughs> which which was, uh, which was, did happen, and it was that orange costume that he enters rehab. That was the one that Elton and I was at dinner with him, showing him some costume designs, and he picked that one up and went, oh, I wish I had that. That's amazing. You know, that's great, which is obviously uh, hugely important for Julian and, and a great sort of endorsement to, to take what, what he did and... And go bigger, go, you know, go crazier. Great. Great. All right, let's um, move now. Oh, <laughs> was there? Okay. <laughs> Saw her before I did. Way to go. Yes, go ahead. Uh, as a biopic, it was very even handed. Um, usually the main character is the only good person, and everyone else in their life is portrayed as. Um, the bad actors, especially when it's a character who's as lonely as this one's portrayed. But it, yeah. So the conversation, because I guess I can't call it an argument since they never had one, between him yeah. and Bernie, when they're both stating their different points of view, uh, how did you approach that with the two characters? Because it definitely seemed like they, the actors were having two different conversations for their point of view of how their relationship had gone at that point. You mean in the restaurant at the end? when Yeah. They you know, yeah, you don't have, it's not bad to reach out for help. It, it really went, it, it's a scene I wrote 
I worked on quite significantly. And, and I know that you can get to a point where you get lost in the mire of, of addiction, uh, that you're only hearing what you want to hear. And, and that as try as some people might to reach out to you and just tell you something really plain and simple, like it's okay to ask for help. When did you give up? You know, Bernie's asking these really simple, but very pointed questions. They're really, they're tough questions. They're, they're simple, but they're, they're, they're reaching through to the real Elton. Um, and, and yes, yeah, sure, they never had an argument. They maybe never had a crossword. I'm sure they've had heated discussions. But but it was really important to me that that uh, that Bernie in that moment illuminates to us how lost Elton is. That he can't even hear the great love of his friend trying to 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 save him. To just say something positive to him that just might make him reflect for a second, rather than just outwardly put all of this kind of uh, aggression and 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 defense um and and it's just it's a tribute to their great acting and 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 um and I, and I feel that that's how that's how we understood it and 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 the frustration that builds drives Bernie to saying when are you going to come down when are you going to land you know th those words of goodbye yellow brick road suddenly become so much more poignant and 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 uh, interesting you know rather than you know the, the, just the simple song they become part of that that attempt by bernie to reach his friend um i i, I you know look these two it's, it's it's the it's the wonder of you know you write something on the page and then you you do some rehearsals with the actors and then we all chat about it and they run the lines and uh, that's great and then you get on the set and then that that red light goes on the camera and they just do that extra something that bit that you that you've not quite seen before that sort of then gives it the magic that that two actors who are brilliant as they are suddenly brings to it and um uh and and they did exactly the same thing for me as well in 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 the cafe scene when they first meet we'd rehearsed that and talked about it and had some fun but even just where they went on the day what they consistently did you know connecting those two characters in in that lovely little scene for me that's just one of the the great scenes of the film so and the other one as well when he when he when he he gets outed as being gay you know that guy says oh your little friend is a homosexual and he's oh my god is it a problem and he says no no not for me and I mean, it's so so beautifully judged just you know both of them are are just fantastic actors yeah Sorry, that Sorry, that, that. We're going to just take one or two more uh, quick questions. Um, was there someone here? Yep. I'm so obsessed with looking at myself, it's just tragic. <laughs> <laughs> Don't ever stop. Uh, firstly, I just want to say thank you so much for that film. I've been a diehard Elton John fan my entire life, and that is just what I needed to be able to watch every month right. for the rest of my life. That was quite good. Um, mm. Speaking of Bernie Tobin, I was so happy to, that you also um, had him featured in the film so much. I think he's incredibly pivotal to Elton's success over the years, so giving him his fair dues was much appreciated. Mm. But I couldn't help but notice that Elton's bandmates, um, mm. specifically Davy Johnston, um, Nigel Olsen and the late Dee Murray weren't <coughs> featured at all. Was that a conscious decision? Is there a reason for that? Because they are also extremely important to Elton's the story. They they are, and it's I don't know how to, I don't know how to sort of answer that really. Rather than more like it was more of an oversight than anything else. I mean, it seems like just such a trite thing to say because as as you know and and I do that they were so key and are a huge part of his life and even to this day you know even Ray Cooper uh, uh, you know bouncing around is an absolute integral part of of his musical life. Um, I suppose what it, what it comes down to is is how deeply do we investigate these relationships and these people and how, how much of a, you know, how, how much of a, of a blind alley do I, do I take, you know, there's lots and lots of key people in Elton's life. I think we maybe have sort of six or seven possibly key relationships that we investigate. Now, of course, over the space of 35 years, Elton's had a lot more than just seven 
people in his life, important relationships. We, you know, at least I'd like to think so. He's really lonely. Um, but I suppose it's, it's just sheer weight of numbers in, in that respect. It's like how, how, how far do I investigate those? How far, how do I, how key do I make them to, to this story? And, uh, it's a, it's, it's a bit of an artistic liberty and license and, um, and there's a tinge of regret there, um, but I don't know what to tell you. Sorry. <laughs> it, it's almost as if the the musical um, collaborations and relationships are all kind of uh, concentrated in his in the the Bernie Taupin relationship in the film. Um, I'm sure there was a lot yeah. more that goes beyond that in terms of his bandmates, but you get a lot from how he worked with Bernie in terms of how he would have responded to other musicians. Yeah. Exactly. I mean, it's kind of like, I suppose the answer is I'm focusing on him and Bernie, really. And, and that, you know, for the purposes of, of this, this story, telling this story, you know, and Elton telling this story about really who, who was so significant in his life, just on a personal terms. Um, Bernie is that person beyond their, their creative uh, musical uh, collaboration the, the, as his friend. As the person who, who's who's been there for him uh, time and time again over over fifty odd years, that 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 person is Bernie, and so that's where the film is really is really digging into that relationship, and why I suppose it, it focuses more on on them on him, Bernie Bernie and Elton's relationship more more than some of the others. I was glad to see Kiki D though. <laughs> Gotta see Kiki D. Yes, of course. All right, we've got time for one more. We are going to go here. Go ahead. Thank you so much. Um, first of all, I just want to say a big congratulations, obviously, on this film, but also on Bohemian Rhapsody. If it's not too late to mention that one. Uh, <laughs> yes. No. Um, and then I just wanted to, yeah, backtrack a little bit to something you said earlier in the conversation, which was that the film had actually made Elton cry. And if I don't know if that's too personal to ask, or if you're allowed to spread that information, but which scenes in particular warranted that reaction from him? Uh, your song affects him. The, the the moment when they create your song, when he writes it, your song with with Bernie uh, early on, I think affects him. Um, there's when Bernie comes to him in the rehab at the end, and to see if he's okay, and and give him. Those lyrics for "I'm Still Standing" uh, uh, affected him deeply, um, and uh, and when he when he hugs himself as a child, I think for him is particularly poignant and uh, and um, moving. In fact, I'd go as far to say as he sort of openly sobbed the first time he saw that. You know, sort of. Um, uh, Taron was with him, and he said he you know was closer to him, and said he was actually quite concerned about him because he. He, he was just absolutely uh, sobbing, sort of uncontrollably almost. Um, I, I think he said to Matthew Vaughan, the producer today, in a phone call, that he's now watched it three times and this was the first time he, he's he's got through without really, really sobbing. I, you know, I think it's such a personal journey and that's what the film endeavours to do is is to really personalise this, this incredible... Uh, survival of someone who's so public and 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 uh, iconic um that i think that that he he really feels it for the rest of us i think we might be able to relate some of our own personal experience to it or we might relate and feel for the characters in there or feel for him as a character and 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 think oh you know my god what's what you know what is the price of that fame for him or the price of that genius and uh, or what what difficult relationships he's had to navigate, but for him it's obviously really really personal, and and um, and it it touches some emotional raw nerves for him, and not in a bad way. He's not like storming out, going, "How dare you!" Uh, I think he's he's sort of so moved to see it portrayed up there so brilliantly by Taron on the screen, and with his music as well. I can't imagine that. 
that he wouldn't cry. If you know what I mean? Not not in a kind of like, well, of course he'll cry. The film's amazing, but 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 it's it's but but it's it's all so personal. He, these things are are drawn from his own recollections, and and um, and Taron's portrayal is so so raw at times um, that I imagine he's he's sort of like. Maybe he feels for himself briefly in those moments, you know, and goes, "Wow, I, re I, I, I did come through something. My God, it was bad." And and uh, and there's obviously a lot of happiness attached to that, and and um, that outpouring of emotion can can manifest itself in floods of tears, tears of happiness. Um, Dexter. Um, Paramount is going to take this movie around the world, and I think it's going to mean a lot for so many people to get to know Elton more, to hear his music, to understand him more. So yeah. I want to thank you so much for making this film and for telling Elton John's story. On behalf of everybody here in Toronto at TIFF Bell Lightbox, thank you, Dexter Fletcher. Thank you. Thank you, Tiff. Thank you. Thanks, everybody.